Chapter Twelve of the Purple Land. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rick Vina. The Purple Land by W. H. Hudson. Chapter Twelve. Before leaving the magistrate's estancia, I had made up my mind to return by the shortest route, and as quickly as possible, to Montevideo, and that morning, mounted on a well-rested horse, I covered a great deal of ground. By twelve o'clock, when I stopped to rest my horse and get some refreshment at a wayside pulperia, I had got over about eight leagues. This was travelling at an imprudent pace, of course, but in the Banda Oriental it is so easy to pick up a fresh horse that one becomes somewhat reckless. My journey that morning had taken me over the eastern portion of the Durazno district, and I was everywhere charmed with the beauty of the country, though it was still very dry, the grass on the higher lands being burnt to various shades of yellow and brown. Now, however, the summer heats were over, for the time was near the end of February. The temperature, without being oppressive, was deliciously warm, so that travelling on horseback was delightful. I might fill dozens of pages with descriptions of pretty bits of country I passed that day, but must plead guilty of an unconquerable aversion to this kind of writing. After this candid confession, I hope the reader will not quarrel with me for the omission. Besides, anyone who cares for these things, and knows how evanescent are the impressions left by word pictures on the mind, can sail the seas and gallop round the world to see them all for himself. It is not, however, every wanderer from England, I blush while saying it, who can make himself familiar with the home habits, the ways of thought and speech of a distant people. Bid me discourse of lowly valley, lofty height, of barren waste, shady wood, or cooling stream, where I have drunk and been refreshed, but all these places, pleasant or dreary, must be in the kingdom called the heart. After getting some information about the country I had to traverse from the pulpero, who told me that I would probably reach the river Yi before evening, I resumed my journey. About four o'clock in the afternoon, I came to an extensive wood of thorn trees, of which the pulpero had spoken, and, in accordance with his instructions, I skirted it on the eastern side. The trees were not large, but there was an engaging wildness about this forest, full of the musical chatter of birds, which tempted me to alight from my horse and rest for an hour in the shade taking the bit from his mouth to let him feed, I threw myself down on the dry grass under a clump of shady thorns, and for half an hour watched the sparkling sunlight falling through the foliage overhead, and listened to the feathered people that came about me, loudly chirping, apparently curious to know what object had brought me to their haunts. Then. I began to think of all the people I had recently mixed with, the angry magistrate and his fat wife, horrid woman, and Marcos Marco, that shabby rascal, rose up before me to pass quickly away, and once more I was face to face with that lovely mystery, Margarita. In imagination I put forth my hands to take hers, and drew her towards me, 
so as to look more closely into her eyes, vainly questioning them as to their pure sapphire hue. Then I imagined or dreamt that with trembling fingers I unbraided her hair to let it fall like a splendid golden mantle over her mean dress, and asked her how she came to possess that garment of glory. The sweet, grave, child lips smiled, but returned no answer. Then a shadowy face seemed to shape itself dimly against the green curtain of foliage, and, looking over the fair girl's shoulder, gaze sadly into my eyes. It was the face of Paquita. Ah, sweet wife, never let the green-eyed monster trouble the peace of your heart. Know that the practical Saxon mind of your husband is puzzling itself over a purely scientific problem, that this surpassingly fair child interests me only because her fairness seems to upset all physiological laws. I was, in fact, just sinking to sleep at this moment, when the shrill note of a trumpet blown close by, and followed by loud shouts from several voices, made me spring instantly to my feet. A storm of answering shouts came from another quarter of the wood, then followed profound silence. Presently, the trumpet sounded again, making me feel very much alarmed. My first impulse was to spring on to my horse and ride away for dear life, but on second thoughts I concluded that it would be safer to remain concealed amongst the trees, as by leaving them I should only reveal myself to the robbers or rebels or whatever they were. I bridled my horse so as to be ready to run, then drew him into a close thicket of dark foliaged bushes, and fastened him there. The silence that had fallen on the wood continued, and at last, unable to bear the suspense longer, I began to make my way cautiously, revolver in hand, towards the point the sounds had proceeded from. Stealing softly through the bushes and trees, where they grew near together, I came at length in sight of an open piece of ground about two or three hundred yards wide and overgrown with grass. Near its border on one side I was amazed to see a group of about a dozen boys, their ages ranging from about ten to fifteen, all standing perfectly motionless. One of them held a trumpet in his hand, and they all wore red handkerchiefs or rags tied round their heads. Suddenly, while I crouched amongst the leafage watching them, a shrill note sounded from the opposite side of the open space, and another troop of boys, wearing white on their heads, burst from the trees and advanced with loud shouts of vivas and mueras towards the middle of the ground. Again, the red heads sounded their trumpet and went out boldly to meet the newcomers. As the two bands approached each other, each led by a big boy, who turned at intervals and with many wild gestures, addressed his followers, apparently to encourage them. I was amazed to see them all suddenly draw out long knives, such as the native horsemen usually wear, and rush furiously together. In a moment they were mingled together in a desperate fight, uttering the most horrible yells, their long weapons glittering in the sunshine as they brandished them about. With such fury did they fight, that in a few moments all the combatants lay stretched out on the grass, excepting three boys wearing the red badges. One of these bloodthirsty young miscreants then snatched up the trumpet and blew 
a victorious blast while the other two shrieked an accompaniment of vivas and mueras while they were thus occupied one of the white-headed boys struggled to his feet and snatching up a knife charged the three reds with desperate courage had i not been perfectly paralyzed with amazement at what i had witnessed i should then have rushed out to aid this boy in his forlorn attempt but in an instant his three foes were on him and dragged him down to the ground two of them then held him fast by the legs and arms the other raised his long knife and was just about to plunge it in the struggling captive's breast when uttering a loud yell i sprang up and rushed at them instantly they started up and fled screaming towards the trees in the greatest terror and then most wonderful thing of all the dead boys all came to life and springing to their feet fled from me after the others this brought me to a stand when seeing that one of the boys limped painfully after his companions hopping on one leg i made a sudden dash and captured him before he could reach the shelter of the trees oh senor do not kill me he pleaded bursting into tears i have no wish to kill you you unspeakable young miscreant but i think i ought to thrash you i answered for though greatly relieved at the turn things had taken i was excessively annoyed at having experienced all those sensations of blood-curdling horror for nothing we were only playing at whites and reds he pleaded i then made him sit down and tell me all about this singular game none of the boys lived very near he said some of them came a distance of several leagues and they had selected this locality for their sports on account of its seclusion for they did not like to be found out their game was a mimic war of whites and reds maneuvers surprises skirmishes throat cutting and all i pitied the young patriot at the last for he had sprained his ankle badly and could scarcely walk and so assisted him to the spot where his horse was hidden then having helped him to mount and given him a cigarette for which he had the impudence to ask me i laughingly bade him good-bye i went back to look for my own horse after that beginning to feel very much amused at the whole thing but alas my steed was gone the young scoundrels had stolen him to revenge themselves on me i suppose for disturbing them and to relieve me from all doubt in the matter they left two bits of rag one white and the other red attached to the branch i had fastened the bridle to for some time i wandered about the wood and even shouted aloud in the wild hope that the young fiends were not going to carry things so far as to leave me without a horse in that solitary place nothing could i see or hear of them however and as it was getting late and i was becoming desperately hungry and thirsty i resolved to go in search of some habitation on emerging from the forest i found the adjacent plain covered with cattle quietly grazing any attempt to pass through the herd would have been almost certain death as these more than half wild beasts will always take revenge on their master man when they catch him dismounted in the open as they were coming up from the direction of the river and were slowly grazing past the wood i resolved to wait for them to pass on before leaving my concealment i sat down and tried to be patient but the brutes were in no hurry and went on skirting the wood at a snail's pace it was about six o'clock before the last stragglers had left and then i ventured out from my hiding place hungry as a wolf and afraid of being overtaken by night 
before finding any human habitation. I had left the trees half a mile behind me, and was walking hurriedly along towards the valley of the Yi, when, passing over a hillock, I suddenly found myself in sight of a bull resting on the grass and quietly chewing his cud. Unfortunately, the brute saw me at the same moment and immediately stood up. He was, I think, about three or four years old, and a bull of that age is even more dangerous than an older one, for he is quite as truculent as the other and far more active. There was no refuge of any kind near, and I knew very well that to attempt to escape by running would only increase my danger. So after gazing at him for a few moments, I assumed an easy, unconcerned manner and walked on. But he was not going to be taken in that way and began to follow me. Then for the first, and I devoutly hope for the last time in my life, I was compelled to resort to the gaucho plan and casting myself face downwards on the earth, lay there simulating death. It is a miserable, dangerous expedient, but in the circumstances I found myself the only one offering a chance of escape from a very terrible death. In a few moments I heard his heavy tramp, then felt him sniffing me all over. After that he tried unsuccessfully to roll me over, in order to study my face, I suppose. It was horrible to endure the prods he gave me and lie still, but after a while he grew quieter and contented himself by simply keeping guard over me, occasionally smelling at my head, then turning round to smell at my heels. Probably his theory was, if he had one, that I had fainted with fear at the sight of him and would recover presently but he was not quite sure at which end of me returning life would first show itself. About once in every five or six minutes he seemed to get impatient, and then he would paw me with his heavy hoof, uttering a low, hoarse moaning, spattering me with froth from his mouth. But as he showed no disposition to leave, I at last resolved to try a very bold experiment for my position was becoming unendurable. I waited till the brute's head was turned from me, then worked my hand cautiously down to my revolver. But before I had quite drawn it, he noticed the movement and wheeled swiftly round, kicking my legs as he did so. Just as he brought his head round close to mine, I discharged the weapon in his face, and a sudden explosion so terrified him that he turned tail and fled, never pausing in his lumbering gallop till he was out of sight. It was a glorious victory, and though I could scarcely stand on my legs at first, so stiff and bruised did I feel all over, I laughed with joy, and even sent another bullet whizzing after the retreating monster, accompanying the discharge with a wild yell of triumph. After that, I proceeded without further interruption on my walk, and, had I not felt so ravenously hungry and so sore, where the bull had trod on me or prodded me with his horns, the walk would have been very enjoyable, for I was now approaching the Yi. The ground grew moist and green, and flowers abounded, many of them new to me, and so lovely and fragrant, that in my admiration for them I almost forgot my pain. The sun went down, but no house appeared in sight. Over the western heavens flamed the brilliant hues of the afterglow, and from the long grass came the sad, monotonous trill of some night insect. Troops of hooded gulls, flew by me on their way from their feeding grounds to the water, uttering their long, 
hoarse, laughter-like cries. How buoyant and happy they seemed, flying with their stomachs full to their rest, while I, dismounted and supperless, dragged painfully on like a gull that had been left behind with a broken wing. Presently, through the purple and saffron-hued vapors in the western sky, the evening star appeared, large and luminous, the herald of swift-coming darkness, and then, weary, bruised, hungry, baffled, and despondent, I sat down to meditate on my forlorn position. End of chapter 12「I sat there till it was very dark, and the longer I sat, the colder and stiffer I grew. Yet I felt no disposition to walk farther. At length, a large owl, flapping down close to my head, gave utterance to a long hiss, followed by a sharp clicking sound, ending with a sudden, loud, laugh-like cry. The nearness of it startled me, and looking up, I saw a twinkling yellow light gleam for a moment across the wide black plain, then disappear. A few fireflies were flitting about the grass, but I felt sure the gleam just witnessed proceeded from a fire, and after vainly trying to catch sight of it again from my seat on the ground, I rose and walked on keeping before me a particular star shining directly over the spot where that transient glimmer had appeared. Presently, to my great joy, I spied it again in the same place, and felt convinced that it was the gleam of firelight shining from the open door or window of some rancho or estancia house. With renewed hope and energy, I hastened on, the light increasing in brightness as I progressed, and after half an hour's brisk walking, I found myself approaching a human dwelling of some kind. I could make out a dark mass of trees and bushes, a long, low house, and nearer to me, a corral or cattle pen of tall, upright posts. Now, however, when a refuge seemed so close, the fear of the terrible, savage dogs kept on most of these cattle-breeding establishments made me hesitate. Unless I wished to run the risk of being shot, it was necessary to shout loudly to make my approach known. Yet, by shouting, I would inevitably bring a pack of huge, frantic dogs upon me, and the horns of the angry bull I had encountered were less terrible to contemplate than the fangs of these powerful, truculent brutes. I sat down on the ground to consider the position, and presently heard the clatter of approaching hoofs. Immediately afterwards three men rode past me, but did not see me, for I was crouching down behind some scrubby bushes. When the horsemen approached the house, the dogs rushed forth to assail them, and their loud, fierce barking, and the wild shouts of some person from the house calling them off, were enough to make a dismounted man nervous. However, now was my only chance, and starting up, I hurried on towards the noise. As I passed the corral, the brutes became aware of my approach, and instantly turned their attention on me. 
I wildly shouted, Ave Maria, then, revolver in hand, stood awaiting the onset. But when they were near enough for me to see that the pack was composed of eight or ten huge, yellow, mastiff-like brutes, my courage failed, and I fled to the corral, where, with an agility surpassing that of a wild cat, so great was my terror, I climbed up a post and placed myself beyond their reach. With the dogs furiously barking under me, I renewed my shouts of Ave Maria, the proper thing to do when you approach a strange house in these pious latitudes. After some time, the men approached, four of them, and asked me who I was and what I did there. I gave an account of myself, then asked whether it would be safe for me to descend. The master of the house took the hint and drove his faithful protectors off, after which I came down from my uncomfortable perch. He was a tall, well-made, but rather fierce-looking gaucho, with keen black eyes and a heavy black beard. He seemed suspicious of me, a very unusual thing in a native's house, and asked me a great many searching questions. And finally, still with some reluctance in his manner, he invited me into the kitchen. There I found a big fire blazing merrily on the raised clay hearth in the center of the large room, and seated near it an old, gray-haired woman, a middle-aged, tall, dark-skinned dame in a purple dress, my host's wife, a pale, pretty young woman about sixteen years old, and a little girl. When I sat down, my host began once more questioning me, but he apologized for doing so, saying that my arrival on foot seemed a very extraordinary circumstance. I told him how I had lost my horse, saddle, and poncho in the wood, and then related my encounter with the bull. They listened to it all with very grave faces, but I am sure it was good as a comedy to them. Don Sinforiano Alde, the owner of the place, and my questioner, made me take off my coat to exhibit the bruises the bull's hoofs had inflicted on my arms and shoulders. He was anxious, even after that, to know something more about me, and so, to satisfy him, I gave him a brief account of some of my adventures in the country, down to my arrest with Marcos Marco, and how that plausible gentleman had made his escape from the magistrate's house. That made them all laugh, and the three men I had seen arrive, and who appeared to be casual visitors, became very friendly, frequently passing me the rum bottle with which they were provided. After sipping mate and rum for half an hour, we settled down to discuss a plentiful supper of roast and boiled beef and mutton, with great basins of well-seasoned broth to wash it down. I consumed an amazing quantity of meat, as much, in fact, as any gaucho there, and to eat as much as one of these men at a sitting is a feat for an Englishman to boast about. Supper done, I lit a cigar and leant back against the wall, enjoying many delightful sensations altogether. Warmth, rest, and hunger satisfied, and the subtle fragrance of that friend and comforter, divine tobacco. On the farther side of the room, my host was meanwhile talking to the other men in low tones. Occasional glances in my direction seemed to show that they still harbored some suspicion of me, or that they had some grave matters to converse about, unsuitable for a stranger to hear. At length, all day rose and addressed me. Signor, if you are ready to rest, I will now conduct you to another room, where you can have some rugs and ponchos 
to make a bed with. If my presence here is not inconvenient, I returned, I would rather remain and smoke by the fire. You see, senor, he said, I have arranged to meet some neighbors and friends who are coming here to discuss matters of importance with me. I am even now expecting their arrival, and the presence of a stranger would scarcely allow us to talk freely over our affairs. Since you wish it, I will go to any part of the house you may think proper to put me in, I returned. I rose, not very cheerfully, I must say, from my comfortable seat before the fire to follow him out when the tramp of galloping horses came to our ears. Follow me this way, quick, exclaimed my impatient conductor. But just as I reached the door, about a dozen mounted men dashed up close to us and burst forth in a perfect storm of yells. Instantly, all those who were in the kitchen sprang to their feet, uttering loud exclamations and looking greatly excited. Then came from the mounted men another wild outburst, as they all yelled together, Viva el General Santa Coloma! Viva! The other three men then rushed from the kitchen, and in excited tones began to ask if anything fresh had happened. Meanwhile, I was left standing at the door by myself. The women appeared almost as excited as the men, except the girl, who had glanced at me with shy compassion in her large, dark eyes when I had been roused from my seat by the fire. Taking advantage of the general excitement, I now repaid that kindly look with one of admiration. She was a quiet, bashful girl, her pale face crowned with a profusion of black hair, and while she stood there waiting, apparently unconcerned by the hubbub outside, she looked strangely pretty, her homemade cotton gown of limp and scanty material clinging closely to her limbs so as to display her slender, graceful form to the best advantage. Presently, seeing me looking at her, she came near, and touching my arm in passing, told me in a whisper to go back to my seat by the fire. I gladly obeyed her, for my curiosity was now thoroughly aroused, and I wished to know the meaning of this outcry which had thrown these phlegmatic gauchos into such a frenzied state of excitement. It looked rather like a political row, but of General Santa Coloma I had never heard, and it seemed curious that a name so seldom mentioned should be the rallying cry of revolutionists. In a few minutes the men all streamed back into the kitchen. Then, the master of the house, all day, his face on fire with emotion, thrust himself into the midst of the crowd. Boys, are you mad? he cried. Do you not see a stranger here? What is the meaning of all this outcry if nothing new has happened? A roar of laughter from the newcomers greeted this outburst, after which they raised another yell of Viva Santa Coloma! All day became furious. Speak, madman, he shouted. Tell me, in God's name, what has happened, or do you wish to ruin everything with your imprudence? Listen, all day, replied one of the men, and know how little we need fear the presence of a stranger. Santa Coloma, the hope of Uruguay, the savior of his country, who will shortly deliver us out of the power of Colorado assassins and pirates. Santa Coloma has come. He is here in our midst. He has seized on El Molino del Yi and has raised the standard of revolt against the infamous government of Montevideo. Viva Santa Coloma! Alde flung his hat off and falling on his knees, 
remained for some moments in silent prayer, his hands clasped before him. The others all snatched off their hats and stood silent, grouped about him. Then he stood up, and all together joined in a viva, which far surpassed in its deafening power their previous performances. My host now appeared to be almost beside himself with excitement. What, he cried, my general, come. Do you tell me that Santa Coloma has come? O oh, friends, the great God has remembered our suffering country at last. He has grown weary of looking on man's injustice, the persecutions, the bloodshed, the cruelties that have almost driven us mad. I cannot realize it. Let me go to my general, that these eyes that have watched for his coming may see him and rejoice. I cannot wait for daylight. This very night must I ride to El Molino, that I may see him and touch him with my hands, and know that it is not a dream. His words were welcomed with a shout of applause and the other men all immediately announced their intention to accompany him to El Molino, a small town on the Yi, some leagues distant. Some of the men now went out to catch fresh horses, while all day busied himself in bringing out a store of old broadswords and carbines from their concealment in some other part of the house. The men talking excitedly together, occupied themselves in scouring and sharpening the rusty weapons, while the women cooked a fresh supply of meat for the last comers. And in the meantime, I was permitted to remain unnoticed by the fire, smoking peacefully. End of chapter 13 Chapter 14 of the Purple Land This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rick Vina The Purple Land by W. H. Hudson Chapter 14 The girl I have mentioned, whose name was Monica, and the child, called Anita, were the only persons there besides myself who were not carried away by the warlike enthusiasm of the moment. Monica, silent, pale, almost apathetic, was occupied serving mate to the numerous guests while the child, when the shouting and excitement was at its height, appeared greatly terrified, and clung to all day's wife, trembling and crying piteously. No notice was taken of the poor little thing, and at length she crept away into a corner to conceal herself behind a faggot of wood. Her hiding-place was close to my seat, and after a little coaxing, I induced her to leave it and come to me. She was a most forlorn little thing, with a white, thin face and large, dark, pathetic eyes. Her mean little cotton frock only reached to her knees, and her little legs and feet were bare. Her age was seven or eight. She was an orphan, and all day's wife, having no children of her own, was bringing her up, or rather, permitting her to grow up under her roof. I drew her to me, and tried to soothe her tremors, and get her to talk. Little by little she gained confidence, and began to reply to my questions. Then I learnt that she was a little shepherdess, although so young, and spent most of the time every day in following the flock about on her pony. Her pony, and the girl Monica, who was some relation, 
cousin the child called her were the two beings she seemed to have the greatest affection for and when you slip off how do you get on again i asked little pony is tame and i never fall off she said sometimes i get off then i climb on again and what do you do all day long talk and play i talk to my doll i take it on the pony when i go with the sheep is your doll very pretty anita no answer will you let me see your doll anita i know i shall like your doll because i like you she gave me an anxious look evidently doll was a very precious being and had not met with proper appreciation after a little nervous fidgeting she left me and crept out of the room then presently she came back apparently trying to screen something from the vulgar gaze in her scanty little dress it was her wonderful doll the dear companion of her rambles and rides with fear and trembling she allowed me to take it into my hands it was or consisted of the forefoot of a sheep cut off at the knee on the top of the knee part a little wooden ball wrapped in a white rag represented the head and it was dressed in a piece of red flannel a satyr like doll with one hairy leg and a cloven foot i praised its pleasing countenance its pretty gown and dainty little boots and all i said sounded very precious to anita filling her with emotions of the liveliest pleasure and you never play with the dogs and cats and little lambs i asked not with the dogs and cats when i see a very little lamb asleep i get down and go softly softly and catch it it tries to get away then i put my finger in its mouth and it sucks and sucks then it runs away and what do you like best to eat sugar when uncle buys sugar aunt gives me a lump i make doll eat some and bite off one small piece and put it in pony's mouth which would you rather have anita a great many lumps of sugar or a beautiful string of beads or a little girl to play with this question was rather too much for her neglected little brain which had fed itself with such simple fare so i was obliged to put it in various ways and at last when she understood that only one of the three things could be chosen she decided in favor of a little girl to play with then i asked her if she liked to hear stories this also puzzled her and after some cross questioning i discovered that she had never heard a story and did not know what it meant listen anita and i will tell you a story i said have you seen the white mist over the yi in the morning a light white mist that flies away when the sun gets hot yes she often saw the white mist in the morning she told me then i will tell you a story about the white mist and a little girl named alma little alma lived close to the river yi but far far from here beyond the trees and beyond the blue hills for the yi is a very long river she lived with her grandmother and with six uncles all big tall men with long beards and they always talked about wars and cattle and horse racing and a great many other important things that alma could not understand there was no one to talk to alma and for alma to talk to or to play with and when she went out of the house where all the big people were talking she heard the cocks crowing the dogs barking the birds singing the sheep bleating and the trees rustling their leaves over her head and she could not understand one word of all they said at last having no one to play with or talk to 
she sat down and began to cry now it happened that near the spot where she sat there was an old black woman wearing a red shawl who was gathering sticks for the fire and she asked alma why she cried because i have no one to talk to and play with said alma then the old black woman drew a long brass pin out of her shawl and pricked alma's tongue with it for she made alma hold it out to be pricked now said the old woman you can go and play and talk with the dogs cats birds and trees for you will understand all they say and they will understand all you say alma was very glad and ran home as fast as she could to talk to the cat come cat let us talk and play together she said oh no said the cat i am very busy watching a little bird so you must go away and play with little niebla down by the river then the cat ran away among the weeds and left her the dogs also refused to play when she went to them for they had to watch the house and bark at strangers then they also told her to go and play with little niebla down by the river then alma ran out and caught a little duckling a soft little thing that looked like a ball of yellow cotton and said now little duck let us talk and play but the duckling only struggled to get away and screamed oh mamma mamma come and take me away from alma then the old duck came rushing up and said alma let my child alone and if you want to play go and play with niebla down by the river a nice thing to catch my ducky in your hands what next i wonder so she let the duckling go and at last she said yes i will go and play with niebla down by the river she waited till she saw the white mist and then ran all the way to the yi and stood still on the green bank close by the water with the white mist all round her by and by she saw a beautiful little child come flying towards her in the white mist the child came and stood on the green bank and looked at alma very very pretty she was and she wore a white dress whiter than milk whiter than foam and all embroidered with purple flowers she had also white silk stockings and scarlet shoes bright as scarlet verbenas her hair was long and fluffy and shone like gold and round her neck she had a string of big gold beads then alma said o oh, beautiful little girl what is your name to which the little girl answered niebla will you talk to me and play with me said alma oh no said niebla how can i play with a little girl dressed as you are and with bare feet for you know poor alma only wore a little old frock that came down to her knees and she had no shoes and stockings on then little niebla rose up and floated away away from the bank and down the river and at last when she was quite out of sight in the white mist alma began to cry when it got very hot she went and sat down still crying under the trees there were two very big willow trees growing near the river by and by the leaves rustled in the wind and the trees began talking to each other and alma understood everything they said is it going to rain do you think said one tree yes i think it will some day said the other there are no clouds said the first tree no there are no clouds to-day but there were some the day before yesterday said the other have you got any nests in your branches said the first tree 
yes one said the other it was made by a little yellow bird and there are five speckled eggs in it then the first tree said there is little alma sitting in our shade do you know why she is crying neighbor the other tree answered yes it is because she has no one to play with little niebla by the river refused to play with her because she is not beautifully dressed then the first tree said ah she ought to go and ask the fox for some pretty clothes to wear the fox always keeps a great store of pretty things in her hole alma had listened to every word of this conversation she remembered that a fox lived on the hillside not far off for she had often seen it sitting in the sunshine with its little ones playing round it and pulling their mother's tail in fun so alma got up and ran till she found the hole and putting her head down it she cried out fox fox but the fox seemed cross and only answered without coming out go away alma and talk to little niebla i am busy getting dinner for my children and have no time to talk to you now then alma cried o oh, fox niebla will not play with me because i have no pretty things to wear o oh, fox will you give me a nice dress and shoes and stockings and a string of beads after a little while the fox came out of its hole with a big bundle done up in a red cotton handkerchief and said here are the things alma and i hope they will fit you but you know alma you really ought not to come at this time of day for i am very busy just now cooking the dinner an armadillo roasted and a couple of partridges stewed with rice and a little omelette of turkey's eggs i mean plover's eggs of course i never touch turkey's eggs alma said she was very sorry to give so much trouble oh never mind said the fox how is your grandmother she is very well thank you said alma but she has a bad headache i am very sorry to hear it said the fox tell her to stick two fresh dock leaves on her temples and to drink a little weak tea made of nut grass and on no account to go out in the hot sun i should like to go and see her only i do not like the dogs being always about the house give her my best respects and now run home alma and try on the things and when you are passing this way you can bring me back the handkerchief as i always tie my face up in it when i have the toothache alma thanked the fox very much and ran home as fast as she could and when the bundle was opened she found in it a beautiful white dress embroidered with purple flowers a pair of scarlet shoes silk stockings and a string of great golden beads they all fitted her very well and next day when the white mist was on the yi she dressed herself in her beautiful clothes and went down to the river by and by little niebla came flying along and when she saw alma she came and kissed her and took her by the hand all the morning they played and talked together gathering flowers and running races over the green sward and at last niebla bade her good-bye and flew away for all the white mist was floating off down the river but every day after that alma found her little companion by the yi and was very happy for now she had someone to talk to and to play with after i had finished the story anita continued gazing into my face with an absorbed expression in her large wistful eyes 
she seemed half scared half delighted at what she had heard but presently before the little thing had said a word monica who had been directing shy and wondering glances towards us for some time came and taking her by the hand led her away to bed i was getting sleepy then and as the clatter of talk and warlike preparation showed no signs of abating i was glad to be shown into another room where some sheepskins rugs and a couple of ponchos were given to me for a bed during the night all the men took their departure for in the morning when i went into the kitchen i only found the old woman and alday's wife sipping bitter mate the child they informed me had disappeared from the house an hour before and monica had gone out to look for her alday's wife was highly indignant at the little one's escapade for it was high time for anita to go out with the flock after taking mate i went out and looking towards the yi veiled in a silvery mist i spied monica leading the culprit home by the hand and went to meet them poor little anita her face stained with tears her little legs and feet covered with clay and scratched by sharp reeds in fifty places her dress soaking wet with the heavy mist looked a most pitiful object where did you find her i asked the girl beginning to fear that i had been the indirect cause of the poor child's misfortunes down by the river looking for a little niebla i knew she would be there when i missed her this morning how did you know that i asked you did not hear the story i told her i made her repeat it all to me last night said monica after that little anita was scolded shaken washed and dried then fed and finally lifted on to the back of her pony and sent to take care of the sheep while undergoing this treatment she maintained a profound silence her little face puckered up into an expression that boded tears they were not for the public however and only after she was on the pony with the reins in her little mites of hands and her back towards us did she give way to her grief and disappointment at having failed to find the beautiful child of the mist i was astonished to find that she had taken the fantastic little tale invented to amuse her as truth but the poor babe had never read books or heard stories and the fairy tale had been too much for her starved little imagination i remember that once on another occasion i told a pathetic story of a little child lost in a great wilderness to a girl about anita's age and just as unaccustomed to this kind of mental fare next morning her mother informed me that my little listener had spent half the night sobbing and begging to be allowed to go and look for that lost child i had told her about hearing that all day would not return till evening or till the following day i asked his wife to lend or give me a horse to proceed on my journey this however she could not do then she added very graciously that while all the men were away my presence in the house would be a comfort to her a man always being a great protection the arrangement did not strike me as one very advantageous to myself but as i could not journey very well to montevideo on foot i was compelled to sit still and wait for all day's return it was dull work talking to those two women in the kitchen they were both great talkers and had evidently come to a tacit agreement to share their one listener fairly between them 
for first one then the other would speak with a maddening monotony alday's wife had six favorite fine-sounding words elements superior division prolongation justification and disproportion one of these she somehow managed to drag into every sentence and sometimes she succeeded in getting in too whenever this happened the achievement made her so proud that she would in the most deliberate cold-blooded way repeat the sentence again word for word the strength of the old woman lay in dates not an occurrence did she mention whether it referred to some great public event or to some trivial domestic incident in her own rancho without giving the year the month and the day the duet between these two confounded barrel organs one grinding out rhetoric the other chronology went on all the morning and often i turned to monica sitting over her sewing in hopes of a different tune from her more melodious instrument but in vain for never a word dropped from those silent lips occasionally her dark luminous eyes were raised for a moment only to sink abashed again when they encountered mine after breakfast i went for a walk along the river where i spent several hours hunting for flowers and fossils and amusing myself as best i could there were legions of duck coot rosy spoonbills and black-necked swans disporting themselves in the water and i was very thankful that i had no gun with me and so was not tempted to startle them with rude noises and send any of them away to languish wounded amongst the reeds at length after having indulged in a good swim i set out to walk back to the estancia when still about a mile from the house as i walked on swinging my stick and singing aloud in lightness of heart i passed a clump of willow trees and looking up saw monica under them watching my approach she was standing perfectly motionless and when i caught sight of her cast her eyes demurely down apparently to contemplate her bare feet which looked very white on the deep green turf in one hand she held a cluster of stalks of the large crimson autumnal lilies which had just begun to blossom my singing ceased suddenly and i stood for some moments gazing admiringly at the shy rustic beauty what a distance you have walked to gather lilies monica i said approaching her will you give me one of your stalks they were gathered for the virgin so i cannot give away any of these she replied if you will wait here under the trees i will find one to give you i agreed to wait for her then placing the cluster she had gathered on the grass she left me before long she returned with a stalk round polished slender like a pipe stem and crowned with its cluster of three splendid crimson flowers when i had sufficiently thanked her and admired it i said what boon are you going to ask from the virgin monica when you offer her these flowers safety for your lover in the wars no senor i have no offering to make and no boon to ask they are for my aunt i offered to gather them for her because i wished to meet you here to meet me monica what for to ask for a story senor she replied colouring and with a shy glance at my face ah we have had stories enough i said remember poor anita running away this morning to look for a playmate 
in the wet mist. She is a child. I am a woman. Then, Monica, you must have a lover who will be jealous if you listen to stories from a stranger's lips in this lonely spot. No person will ever know that I met you here, she returned, so bashful, yet so persistent. I have forgotten all my stories, I said. Then, senor, I will go and find you another ramo of lilies while you think of one to tell me. No, I said, you must get no more lilies for me. Look, I will give you back these you gave me. And saying that, I fastened them in her black hair, where, by contrast, they looked very splendid and gave the girl a new grace. Ah, Monica, they make you look too pretty. Let me take them out again. But she would not have them taken. I will leave you now to think of a story for me, she said, blushing and turning away. Then I took her hands and made her face me. Listen, Monica, I said, do you know that these lilies are full of strange magic? See how crimson they are. That is the color of passion, for they have been steeped in passion and turn my heart to fire. If you bring me any more of them, Monica, I shall tell you a story that will make you tremble with fear, tremble like the willow leaves, and turn pale as the mist over the ye. She smiled at my words. It was like a ray of sunlight falling through the foliage on her face. Then, in a voice that was almost a whisper, she said, what will the story be about, senor? Tell me, then I shall know whether to gather lilies for you or not. It will be about a stranger meeting a sweet, pale girl standing under the trees, her dark eyes cast down, and red lilies in her hand, and how she asked him for a story, but he could speak to her of nothing but love, love, love. When I finished speaking, she gently withdrew her hands from mine, and turned away amongst the trees, doubtless to fly from me, trembling at my words, like a frightened young fawn from the hunter. So for a moment I thought. But no, there lay the lilies, gathered for a religious purpose at my feet, and there was nothing reproachful in the shy, dark eyes when they glanced back for a moment at me, for in spite of those warning words, she had only gone to find more of those perilous crimson flowers to give me. Not then, while I waited for her return with palpitating heart, but afterwards in calmer moments, and when Monica had become a pretty picture in the past, did I compose the following lines. I am not so vain as to believe that they possess any great poetical merit, and introduce them principally to let the reader know how to pronounce the pretty name of that oriental river, which it still keeps in remembrance of a vanished race. Standing silent, pale her face was, pale and sweet to see, neath the willows waiting for me, willow-like was she, smiling, blushing, trembling, bashful maid of ye. Willow-like she trembled, yet she never fled from me, but her dove-like eyes were downcast, on the grass to see white feet standing, white thy feet were, maid of ye. Stalks of lilies in her hands were, crimson lilies three, placed I in her braids of black hair, they were bright to see. Lift thy dark eyes, for I love thee, maid of ye. End of chapter 14
Chapter 15 of The Purple Land This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jairus Amar The Purple Land by W. H. Hudson Chapter 15 In the evening, Aldi returned with a couple of his friends, and, as soon as an opportunity offered, I took him aside and begged him to let me have a horse to continue my journey to Montevideo. He answered evasively that the horse I had lost in the neighboring forest would probably be recovered in the course of two or three days. I replied that if he would let me have a horse, the one I had lost, together with the saddle, poncho, etc., could be claimed by him whenever they turned up. He then said that he could not very well give me a horse, with saddle and bridle also. It looked as if he wanted to keep me in his house for some purpose of his own, and this made me all the more determined to leave it immediately, in spite of the tender, reproachful glances which Monica flashed on me from under her long, drooping eyelashes. I told him that if I could not have a horse, I would leave his estancia on foot. That rather put him in a corner, for in this country, where horse-stealing and cheating at cards are looked on as venial offenses, to let a man leave your estancia on foot is considered a very dishonorable thing. He pondered over my declaration for some minutes, then, After conferring with his friends, he promised to provide me with all I required next day. I had heard nothing more about the revolution, but after supper, all day suddenly became very confidential, and said that the whole country would be up in arms in the course of a very few days, and that it would be highly dangerous for me to attempt traveling by myself to the capital. He expatiated on the immense prestige of General Santa Coloma, who had just taken up arms against the Colorado party then in power, and concluded by saying that my safest plan would be to join the rebels and accompany them on their march to Montevideo, which would begin almost immediately. I replied that I took no interest in the dissensions of the Banda Oriental, and did not wish to compromise myself by joining a military expedition of any kind. He shrugged his shoulders, and, renewing his promise of a horse next day, retired to rest. On rising next morning, I found that the others were already up. The horses were standing saddled at the door, and all day, pointing out a very fair-looking animal, informed me that it had been saddled for me and then added that he and his friends would ride one or two leagues with me to put me on the right road to Montevideo. He had suddenly become almost too kind, but in the simplicity of my heart I believed that he was only making amends for the slight inhospitality of the day before. After partaking of a bitter mate, I thanked my hostess, looked my last into Monica's dark, sorrowful eyes, lifted for one moment to mine, and kissed little Anita's pathetic face, by so doing, filling the child with astonishment and causing considerable amusement to the other members of the family. After we had ridden about four miles, keeping nearly parallel with the river, it struck me that we were not going in the right direction, the right one for me, at any rate. I therefore checked my horse and told my companions that I would not trouble them to ride with me any further. My friend, said Alde, approaching me, you will, if you leave us now, infallibly fall into the hands of some partida, who, finding you without a passport, will take you to El Molino or to some other center, though it would make no difference if you had a passport for they would only tear it up and take you all the same. 
In these circumstances, it is your safest plan to go with us to El Molino, where General Santa Coloma is collecting his forces, and you will then be able to explain your position to him. I refuse to go to El Molino, I said angrily, exasperated at his treachery. You will then compel us to take you there, he returned. I had no wish to become a prisoner again so soon, and, seeing that a bold stroke was necessary to keep my liberty, I suddenly reined up my horse and drew my revolver. My friends, I said, your road lies in that direction, mine in this. I wish you good morning. I had scarcely finished speaking before a blow of a heavy whip handle descended on my arm below the elbow, almost breaking it, and sending me off my horse, while the revolver went spinning away a dozen yards. The blow had been dealt by one of Alde's two followers, who had just dropped a little to the rear, and the rascal certainly showed a marvelous quickness and dexterity in disabling me. Wild with rage and pain, I scrambled to my feet and, drawing my knife, threatened to stab the first man who approached me, and then, in unmeasured language, I abused Alde for his cowardice and brutality. He only smiled, and replied that he considered my youth, and therefore felt no resentment against me for using such intemperate words. And now, my friend, he continued, after picking up my revolver and remounting his horse. Let us waste no more time, but hasten on to El Molino, where you can state your case to the general. As I did not wish to be tied on to my horse and carried in that unpleasant and ignominious manner, I had to obey. Climbing into the saddle with some difficulty, we set out towards the village of El Molino at a swinging gallop. The rough motion of the horse I rode increased the pain in my arm till it became intolerable. Then one of the men mercifully bound it up in a sling, after which I was able to travel more comfortably, though still suffering a great deal. The day was excessively warm, and we did not reach our destination till about three o'clock in the afternoon. Just before entering the town, we rode through a little army of gauchos and camped on the adjacent plain. Some of them were engaged cooking meat. Others were saddling horses, while others, in bodies of twenty or thirty, were going through cavalry exercises, the whole making a scene of wonderful animation. Very nearly all the men wore the ordinary gaucho costume, and those who were exercising carried lances, to which were attached little white fluttering bannerets. Passing through the encampment, we clattered into the town, composed of about seventy or eighty houses of stone or mud, some thatched, others with tiled roofs, and every house with a large garden attached to it. At the official building facing the plaza, a guard of ten men, armed with carbines, were stationed. We dismounted and went into the building, only to hear that the general had just left the town and was not expected back till the following day. All they spoke to an officer sitting at a table in the room we were shown into, addressing him as major. He was a thin, elderly man, with calm gray eyes and a colorless face and looked like a gentleman. After hearing a few words from Alde, he turned to me and said courteously that he was sorry to tell me I should have to remain in El Molino till the general's return, when I could give an account of myself to him. We do not, he said in conclusion, wish to compel any foreigner, or any oriental even, to join our forces but we are naturally suspicious of strangers, having already caught two or three spies in the neighborhood. Unfortunately, 
you are not provided with a passport, and it is best that the general should see you. Sir officer, I replied, by ill-treating and detaining an Englishman, you are doing your cause no good. He answered that he was grieved that his people had found it necessary to treat me roughly, for he put it in that mild way. Everything he said, short of liberating me, would be done to make my sojourn in El Molino pleasant. If it is necessary that the general should see me himself before I can have my liberty, pray let these men take me to him at once, I said. He has not yet left El Molino, said an orderly, standing in the room. He is at the end of the town, at the Casa Blanca, and does not leave till half-past three. It is early that now, said the officer, consulting his watch. Take him to the general at once, Lieutenant Alday. I thanked the officer, who had looked and spoken so unlike a revolutionary bandit, and, as soon as I had succeeded in clambering onto my horse, we were once more dashing along the main street at a fast gallop. We drew up before a large, old-looking stone house at the end of the town, standing some distance back from the road, and screened from it by a double row of tall Lombardy poplars. The back of the house was towards the road, and, passing round to the front after leaving our horses at the gate, we entered a spacious patio, or yard. Running along the front of the dwelling was a wide corridor, supported by wooden pillars, painted white, while the whole of the patio was shaded by an immense grapevine. This was evidently one of the best houses in the place, and, coming directly from the glaring sun and the white dusty road, the vine-shaded patio and corridor looked delightfully cool and inviting. A gay company of twelve or fifteen people were gathered under the corridor, some sipping mate, others sucking grapes, and when we came on the scene, a young lady was just finishing a song she was singing. I at once singled out General Santa Coloma, sitting by the young lady with the guitar, a tall, imposing man, with somewhat irregular features, and a bronzed, weather-beaten face. He was booted and spurred, and over his uniform wore a white silk poncho with purple fringe. I judged from his countenance that he was not a stern or truculent man, as one expects a cadillo, a leader of men, and the banda oriental to be, and, remembering that in a few minutes he would be leaving the house, I was anxious to push forward and state my case to him. The others, however, prevented me, for the general just then happened to be engaged in a vivacious conversation with the young lady sitting by him. When I had once looked attentively at this girl, I had eyes for no other face there. The type was Spanish, and I have never seen a more perfect face of the kind a wealth of blue-black hair shading the low, broad forehead, straight nose, dark, luminous eyes, and crimson, pouting lips. She was tall, perfect in her figure as in her face, and wore a white dress with a deep red china rose on her bosom for only ornament. Standing there unnoticed at the end of the corridor, I gazed with a kind of fascination on her, listening to her light, rippling laughter, and lively talk, watching her graceful gestures, her sparkling eyes, and damask cheeks flushed with excitement. Here is a woman, I thought, with a sigh. I felt a slight twinge at that disloyal sigh. I could have worshipped. She was pressing the guitar on the general. You have promised to sing one song before you go, and I cannot let you off, she exclaimed. At length 
he took the instrument, protesting that his voice was a very bad one. Then, sweeping the strings, began that fine old Spanish song of love and war. Cuando suena la trompa guerrera. His voice was uncultivated and somewhat harsh, but there was a good deal of fire and expression in the performance, and it was rapturously applauded. The moment the song was over, he handed her back the guitar, and, starting up hastily, bade the company adieu and turned to go. Coming forward, I placed myself before him and began to speak. I am pressed for time and cannot listen to you now, he said quickly, scarcely glancing at me. You are a prisoner, wounded, I see. Well, when I return... Suddenly he stopped, caught hold of my wounded arm, and said, How did you get hurt? Tell me quickly. His sharp, impatient manner, and the sight of twenty people all standing round staring at me, quite upset me and I could only stammer out a few unintelligible words, feeling that my face was blushing scarlet to the very roots of my hair. Let me tell you, General, said Alde, advancing. No, no, said the General. He shall speak. The sight of Alde so eager to give his version of the affair first restored my anger to me, and with that came back the power of speech and the other faculties which I had lost for a moment. Sir General, all I have to say is this, I said. I came to this man's house at night, a stranger, lost on foot, for my horse had been stolen from me. I asked him for shelter in the belief that at least one virtue of hospitality still survives in this country. He, assisted by these two men, treacherously disabled me with a blow on my arm, and dragged me here a prisoner. My good friend, said the general, I am extremely sorry that you have been hurt through an excess of zeal on the part of one of my people. But I can scarcely regret this incident, painful as it seems, since it enables me to assure you that one other virtue besides hospitality still survives in the Banda Oriental. I mean gratitude. I do not understand you, I said. You were companions in misfortune a very short time ago, he returned. Have you forgotten the service you did me then? I stared at him, astonished at his words, and while I looked into his face, suddenly that scene at the magistrate's estancia, when I went with the key to let my fellow traveller out of the stocks, and he jumped up and seized my hand, flashed on me. Still I was not quite sure, and half whispered tentatively, What? Marcos Marco? Yes, he returned smiling. That was my name at that moment. My friends, he continued, resting a hand on my shoulder and speaking to the others, I have met this young Englishman before, a few days ago, when I was on my way hither, I was arrested at Las Cuevas in this company. It was by means of his assistance that I succeeded in making my escape. He did this good deed, believing at the time that he was helping a poor peasant and not expecting any return. I might have reminded him that only after he had given me a solemn assurance that he did not intend attempting to make his escape did I consent to get his legs out of the stocks. However, as he thought proper to forget that part of the affair, I was not going to recall it to him. There were many surprised exclamations from the bystanders, and, glancing at that beautiful girl who was standing near with the others, I found her dark eyes fixed on my face with an expression of tenderness and sympathy in them that sent the blood rushing to my heart. They have hurt you badly, I fear, said the general, addressing me again. To continue your journey now would be imprudent. 
let me beg you to remain where you are, in this house, till your arm is better. Then, turning to the young lady, he said, Dolores, will you and your mother take charge of my young friend till I return, and see that his injured arm is attended to? My general, you will make us happy by leaving him in our care, she replied with a bright smile. He then introduced me as Don Ricardo, simply, for he did not know my surname, to the lovely senorita, Dolores Zelaya, after which he again bade us adieu, and hurried away. When he had gone, all day advanced, hat in hand, and gave me back my revolver, which I had forgotten all about. I took it with my left hand, and put it in my pocket. He then apologized for having treated me roughly. The major had taught him that word, but without the faintest trace of servility in his speech or manner, and after that he offered me his hand. Which will you have, I said, the hand you have injured or the left hand? He immediately dropped his own hand to his side, then, bowing, said that he would wait till I had recovered the use of my right hand. Turning to go, he added with a smile that he hoped the injury would soon heal, so that I would be able to wield a sword in my friend Santa Coloma's cause. His manner, I thought, was a little too independent. Pray take back your horse now, I said, as I have no further use for it, and accept my thanks for for conducting me this far on my journey. Do not mention it, he replied, with a dignified wave of his hand. I am pleased to have been able to render you this small service. End of chapter 15